now. It is an honor for me to welcome Rita Sharon today as our keynote speaker in this seminar. Rita Sharon is a general internist and literary scholar at Columbia University who originated the field of narrative medicine around 2000. She's a professor of medicine and she is founder and executive director of the program in narrative medicine at Columbia. Since 2018, she is also chair of Columbia's new Department of Medical Humanities and Ethics. Rita Sharon's research focuses on the consequences of narrative medicine practice, reflective clinical practice, and healthcare team effectiveness. She has written the influential monograph, Narrative Medi Medicine, Honoring the Stories of Illness in 2006, and most recently co-authored the book the Principles and Practice of Narrative Medicine in 2017, both published at uh, Oxford University Press. Her articles in leading cross-disciplinary journals are almost countless. Since 2016, Rita Sharon has been affiliated with researchers at University of Southern Denmark, giving lectures at seminars and guest lectures in our narrative medicine courses, and she has also kindly invited the university's researchers to attend her own teaching in various narrative medicine courses at Columbia, including me. In 2018, she gave the prestigious Jefferson Lecture in the Humanities. You can all watch it on YouTube. And today we honor her as adjunct professor of Faculty of Humanities at SDA. You may have noticed uh, today that today's lecture will also be filmed. Rita, mm -hmm. a warm welcome. Thank you. Now what do I do with this? Let's hope this works. OK. And this goes in the other pocket. All right, we're set. So, so this is a very big challenge that you all have chosen um, to embark on. A lot of us talk about interdisciplinarity, and it's something that seems to be quite, uh, if not de rigueur, at least um, possible at this institution. Uh, it is not the case elsewhere, as you know. Um, it is um, perhaps in older um, universities, the um, walls between disciplines have become very calcified. And it's really hard to um, invite someone from another department to give a lecture in your school um, and to pay them. It's impossible. And so if there's any interdisciplinary work that goes on, it's all um, charitable. So there's no way to write grants together. It's very hard. So you, you guys should feel very lucky that you're in a place that seems, even kind of architecturally, to be open to wandering and flexibility. Um, um, this, is the, th this, is the, this is the image I found a long time ago that seemed to um, depict the kind of listening that we hope goes on within narrative medicine, which is, um, it, it's called The Conversation. Uh, the author is Mary Cassatt. Um, and I chose it because um, it's non-denominational. It doesn't look like it's in healthcare in particular. They could be sisters, they could be um, friends, they could be neighbors. Um, but there is um, a very, um, thoughtful thinking going on in the listener's face um, um, while the light of the, uh, this is a pastel, is on the face of the teller. And I was trying to say something about the affiliation between these two. What I know now is that healthcare is probably the worst case scenario for interdisciplinarity. It's worse, it's harder, I believe, to have these kinds of conversations uh, surrounding health than it is surrounding law, 
surrounding architecture, surrounding education, surrounding music. Imagine if I'm an architect and, and, and Anners is an engineer and we're building a bridge together or we're building a building. Well, I can say to him, design-wise, I'd really like for this to be 200 stories high. That would, that would fit my aesthetic of the building. And then Anders would say, well, I appreciate the aesthetic of the building, but that's, that's going to be unsafe on this particular terrain. So you can't do that. But we would still be kind of together in the conception of the problem. Whereas if I'm the internist, which I am, and Anders is the literary scholar, which he is, um, we are talking from contradicting and colliding conceptions, where my conception from its foundation has to be reductive, because what I know about and what I intervene in is organs and tissues and molecules. This is what I do. And not only do I not have patience for, but I don't have the equipment to think about uh, um, the nuance of the individual person. So for you to say to me, no, 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 uh, uh, you have to take your, your patient with rheumatoid arthritis and remember that she has a life and she lives on the certain block and she, she's uh, uh, involved in the toxic uh, environmental something, something. And I have to say, um, I don't care. Do, do, do you understand what I'm saying? That, that these are by nature colliding far more than the case in these other fields. That the, uh, uh, this is a reason to do it, but we do have to know that we are entering an arena where the foundational understandings of the problem are not only diverse, but they're in conflict. And this is why it's so necessary to do, and also why it takes a long time to do, because we have to uh, rather slowly coach our partners across the aisle to not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Your organs and tissues and molecules will continue to be very important. Do you see? I am not calling you a scoundrel because you hold on to your organs and tissues and molecules. Rather, I, I'm speaking now as the literary scholar, I'm very curious about your organs and tissues and molecules. Please tell me something about these checkpoint inhibitors. Do, do you see? So, so I, I'm just, before going into the kind of work we're doing, I just want to uh, alert you that this particular effort at interdisciplinarity is, I think, really um, among the highest challenges to the desire to enrich and enlarge any one viewpoint on a serious topic. Right? So, um, I've listed some of, the, uh, some of the problems, the conversations between the academy and the clinic. Are we still in two worlds? You all know C.P. Snow's Two Worlds. Do you know that essay? It's from the 50s um, where the um, scientist and novelist, he was both, um, first bemoans the fact that science doesn't talk to art and art doesn't talk to science. And he comes down rather squarely on the side of let science reign. Because he, uh, it, it was his assertion that uh, the humanity scholars are terribly undereducated in science and, and, and they better get with it. Well, the two cultures continues now. Um, but we have, we have begun to bridge them. And, and I'm not going to talk anymore about law or music or architecture, 
um, um, I'll stay squarely within the, the, the healthcare domain. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about three, well, yeah, three different kinds of interdisciplinarity. One is interdisciplinarity among the clinical professions. One is interdisciplinarity among the humanities professions. And then there are some efforts to actually cross those. But each one of them has challenges. So um, let me just start with an example that I hope is going to be one of the, 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 the last ones. We're starting, and this is with funding through the provost office at Columbia, we're starting a certificate program which is in the US uh, a specialty track, if you will, in some of the doctoral programs. So this will be a specialty track for humanities doctoral students in, in literature and philosophy and history, maybe qualitative anthropology, uh, psychology. Um, and it has become the case in the States that medical humanities is being more and more taught so that in undergraduate colleges, uh, you can be a major in medical humanities in more and more colleges. Now, this is pre-graduate school. Um, it is the case that more and more medical schools are hiring, 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 did I say hiring? <laughs> Um, humanities uh, PhDs to teach in the medical school or the nursing school or pharmacy or, or the other disciplines. So, so there is a increasing need for both the humanities scholars and the medical people to know something about how to teach this, to know, some, to know something about the field of medical humanities beyond their corner of it. So uh, we've, we've got a, uh, a program, we, ju we just started with the design year, uh, bringing together a cohort of humanities doctoral students and advanced medicine, nursing, and public health uh, um, um, advanced students to together teach them how to teach this. And what it requires is a um, transcending of the kind of conflict that inevitably uh, uh, emerges. So the physicians, nurses, and public health people are going to have to lay aside their anxiety about um, hypothesis testing and p-values and give themselves over to some of the pleasures and uh, uh, um, difficulties of reading texts. And the humanities scholars, quite against their desire, are going to have to come up to the hospital. And I'm going to make them um, spend a few nights in the emergency room and follow along interns on, on the wards and see what goes on in the neonatal intensive care unit because they need to know something about suffering. And it's not enough to read Frankenstein. They need to know something about suffering. They need even to feel a little implicated in the health care that goes on. So I'm making them take, um, you don't have this here, HIPAA is our privacy confidentiality um, training. So they need to train in the laws and the policies of confidentiality. Otherwise, we won't let them in. To these, to these clinical sites. They need to get all their blood tests, all their, their TB stuff. We want to make sure they're not going to give measles to pregnant women. All right? So they have to be part of the team. Um, and some of them are not going to want to do that. OK? So, so the idea is to um, kind of let them become a bit of a tribe together. That's what we're hoping for. And, and I predict that those who receive this training, and it's going to be like a year long, and there's going to be required courses and a capstone. And I mean, it's not insignificant. Um, and those who accomplish this will have much more success in getting, forgive me for being uh, uh, strategic, uh, in getting positions. 
you see? There are more open positions in medical humanities than there are in English in the States. So, so that's, that's one of the things, and I hope you can tell in how I'm describing it, that if we're successful, there will be more than a, uh, how can I say, sullen tolerance of one another's positions, uh, but rather that there will be some form of, um, I'm not going to call it conversion, but um, some, some form of enlightenment. Yeah? Um, now, this, 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 is, this is where we're actually trying to merge the two worlds. I want to tell you a little bit about how complex it is even to do interdisciplinarity among clinical professions. Now, tell me, talk to me, are you, are you doing a lot of work that brings together nurses, doctors, physical therapists? Tell me about it. No. Hello. No? no. Yes. Yes? Yes. We are working and we have also a, a master education where all the nurses, uh, um, the physiotherapists, the, all the midwives and six other groups uh, are coming together to have the education together. Okay, but did it start? That's, that's a way to start to make them work interdisciplinary, okay. to make projects that go on after, after they finish. But did it start? It started 20 years ago. I started it 20 okay. years ago. Okay. And has it been? It has been a great success. Good. And also when they started on the more mono, uh, mono education, where it's only nurses or the only uh, right. uh, uh, physiotherapists and so on, this is a very uh, deep success. Okay, this is very important for, for you all to know. Um, there, are, there are competitions and um, um, ill will um, among even the clinical disciplines. Um, tremendous ill will. Um, mostly because the doctors, that's, I mean, I'm one of them, uh, assume that they're going to be the leader of any team they're on. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we have, I have taken on that responsibility at Columbia. Uh, we got money from the Macy Foundation and then we got central funds to bring together, we're now up to 10 different disciplines. Um, but what it took to begin with was a whole year spent only with very senior faculty from each of the major schools to wean them away from the distrust that they had of one another. Um, the, the silos were present for reasons, and it's because they couldn't share. And so it got to the point, I don't know if this is the case here, that the, um, the school calendars are different. Medicine, nursing, dentistry, public health. The winter holidays are different. Three different winter holidays for, for these schools. Um, there, there's, it, it, it's as if we're, we're, we're prevented from having something that students from all the schools can come to. And this, of course, uh, trickled down to the students who even before they started, the nursing students had real loathing for the physicians because of just how they heard their faculty talking about doctors. And the medical students, before we did all this, were, there was no loathing, there was complete indifference. What, why do I care what nurses do? And that too was, was derived from their elders. So, so it took us a whole year, it was like detoxifying um, with, with the leaders of the schools, and we did that. And the way we did it was through narrative medicine. And we didn't talk about health matters at all. We talked about fiction and, and cinema, and we had them writing stories. And they were very aghast at the beginning. I, I gave them the, the, the beginning of a story and asked them, please finish the story. Write the ending. And they said, no, I don't know how to do that. You know, and they kind of sat 
but then they watched one another, and the others were doing it, so they tried. And of course, it was brilliant. And they had no idea that they had it within them to simply make something up. So, so after a year of working with them, then we, we were able to together build courses um, for, for these students. Um, and, and, and by now, as I say, they're hefty educational interventions for the students together. And that is because the faculty have been able to buy in. Um, however, the kind of lessons that are taught treat interprofessional practice. This is very, very practical. So like, how does it work to have a team in the operating room? where the doctor is not in charge, it's the head nurse who's in charge. And, and how does it happen that they all follow a drill and do kind of uh, team necessary activities? These are the, the so-called competences that we try to uh, develop. And you see, they're all very instrumental. What are the roles of all the, 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 the disciplines? What are their responsibilities? What are their own values vis-a-vis -vis the kind of teamwork? Uh, how do you even talk to one another? There's like, well, I know that, that um, I, I call Smith Dr. Smith if he's a doctor. What do I call Smith if he's a nurse? Do I call him Mr. Smith? Do I call him Nurse Smith? Do I call him Charlie? See, I mean, even simple, simple things like, like how do you talk to one another? Uh, it is the case, and we've done complex uh, linguistic work in one of the intensive care units, um, that on rounds, on morning rounds, when the whole team uh, goes around, the nurses are literally not allowed to talk. The nurse will ask a question at rounds, and they'll say, oh, well, just go talk to the social worker afterwards, that it's not part of rounds to say, but we have to figure out what to do because her daughter is leaving for Tokyo tonight. Oh, well, that's not important. So, so there's a tremendous amount of work simply, simply at this level of, of how do these persons do the minimal amount of communicating so as to be able to solve problems together. Do you see? Um, so, so these are the things that we try to, to um, develop and work toward. Now, let me show you where the, the narrative comes in. These are, these are the, the, can you read these? I don't know from up top, but we've got 10. We're so happy to include chaplains and dentists. Genetic counseling is our newest one. Medicine, nursing, nutrition, OTPT, public health, and social work. Um, which even goes beyond the health sciences campus. The social work is down on arts and sciences. So, so we feel very, um, oh, boasting that we've been able to attract this many of the disciplines. And of course, with the schools come faculty. So our steering committee is like 25 people and, and all of them very engaged. Um, now, the, the, the successes continue to be made through narrative methods. So that when we have these interprofessional, um, we, we have an IPE day, which is one day when all the classes are canceled on the health sciences campus. All the classes are canceled. Uh, and we get all the classrooms. We get all the auditoriums. And in that one day, we, ha we were teaching 1,800 students with 75 faculty members and 150 uh, workshops, seminars, and lectures. And it's like a big, splashy Olympics. And, and you can imagine the amount of work it takes to <laughs> pull this off. Um, but that it is like the institution's statement that this is something we want to get good at. Um, Many of the, uh, the things on IPE Day, IPE Nights is simply a monthly iteration of that. Um, our, shared, our shared clinical teaching, this one, is kind of the, uh, the highlight. It's a semester long, um, um, uh, how can I say, um, it's a real seminar. I mean, you come every week and you do homework and you have to write papers. 
um, but the students are a few from each of these schools. Do you see? I mean, there'll, there'll be, you know, one nurse, one doctor, one, uh, and there's what do we have? Sixteen at the t at, at the most. But the point is that they're really together, learning things that don't belong to any one discipline. So there's one seminar on, on death and dying. There's one seminar on healthcare justice. There's one seminar on relationships of care, that kind of thing. Uh, there's one on spirituality and healthcare. And there, the work is very much fueled by narrative work, where one of us from narrative medicine is there teaching um, and, and bringing up issues and questions and conversation based on um, works of art based on actual uh, expressive writing that goes on. 